So I need Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Suzanne Feedham, nursing research consultant here at Children's National. I inviting you and welcome you to this uh, closing keynote session for the day. And um, this morning, Dr. O'Meara and the panel talked about passion. Dr. Eleanor Reed Whalen's career exemplifies passion for health policy and improving care and health care systems. Her career is built on understanding and creating new models of care delivery to enhance patient and family care and outcomes. She is focused on models that improve health outcomes while controlling costs and maximizing the roles of nursing and the entire health care team. Dr. Whalen is not new to affecting policy change and examining care models. As an undergraduate at Georgetown, she was a leader in starting an on-campus ambulance service for sick and injured members of the Georgetown community. This program continues today with 10 ambulances and, 100 over, and hundreds of students trained as responders. As a nurse in the emergency department at our friendly hospital up the road, CHOP, and a nurse practitioner student at the University of Pennsylvania, she wondered if the care in the ED walk-in clinic could be strengthened by the inclusion of advanced practice nurses in addition to the rotating visiting fellows. As a new NP, she negotiated with the medical director and pioneered that role. Today, the CHOP walk-in clinic is staffed mostly by advanced practice nurses. In the process of starting a nursing center in West Philadelphia, she wondered who developed some of the challenging health policies governing the health system, and she determined she wanted to work to change the system of the, at the policy level. Following her doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania and a postdoctoral fellowship in primary care policy, she was awarded an RWJ Health Policy Fellowship and moved to Washington to immerse herself in the policymaking process. She spent one year with Senator Dasho and then four years with Senator, Senator McCloskey as the director for the Subcommittee on Aging and the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, also known as the Health Committee. She then went to the Center for American Progress, a think tank, during the development of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Her current roles at um, CMS and CNMI, which is the Center for Medicaid and CHIP, she places her, she's in a position to implement and evaluate components of the ACA, specifically delivery system reform. It has been stated that staffing science, this is my unpaid political announcement, it has been stated that staffing science is a necessary part of the scientific enterprise and for policy. Dr. Whalen's grounding as a pediatric clinician, her scientific preparation and training, and her experience in policy exemplifies the critical importance of bringing science and a clinical lens to policy. Through all of her positions in policy, Dr. Whalen works to advance the visibility and contributions of nursing while improving health and care delivery systems. Her career trajectory has demonstrated impact at the personal health community, national levels. It is also a privilege that today some of the grantees from Children's for a CMS grant that is working with Dr. Whelan uh, are here this afternoon and we're pleased that they could attend and hear her presentation. It is a privilege for me to welcome Dr. Whelan as a national leader in nursing and health care. Thank you for that very generous introduction, Dr. Feedham. And I'm, I don't know how many of you have been able to work with uh, Dr. Feedham, but there are so many nurses that would not be where they are today had it not been for the mentoring and um, just generosity of spirit of, of helping folks get to where we are, um, in, especially in terms of policy. When I got to D.C., one of the first uh, people that I was introduced to was Dr. Feedham because she was so ingrained in policy and um, never stopping to make sure that um, we have as many clinicians as possible in the uh, in the policy arena. So thank you for the introduction, but thank you for all that you do too. And thank you for inviting me here today. Um, 
I think I'm not going through puberty. I think that my voice is like this because I've got a cold, so I apologize in advance if it's going to come off as kind of squeaky, and I hope that it lasts for the next hour. I'm also thrilled to see some of our awardees here, and I'll talk a little bit about the um, Innovation Center um, and um, what we're doing there um, as I get a little bit further. So today what I'm going to do is talk a little about, about Medicaid and coverage. I've been at the Innovation Center for five years, um, and in terms of a policy, it's been really fascinating because when I was at the think tank, I worked a little bit on the legislation that became the Innovation Center. And it's been fascinating to be at the Innovation Center since the beginning. In the legislation, there's like a little paragraph, section 3021, that says, here's what you'll be doing, and I'll get a little bit more into it later. And then basically, we've got a group of people, and you just kind of have to make that paragraph become a reality. And that's been really fascinating and been a real privilege to be able to be there. So I'm going to talk a little bit first just about Medicaid and, and coverage. For the past year, in addition to helping to coordinate the pediatric population and awards at the Innovation Center, I've also now been the Chief Population Health Officer at Medicaid, looking to see what kinds of opportunities we can foster in Medicaid and delivery system reform and kind of a broader population health. Um, after I talk about Medicaid, we'll go through kind of delivery system reform, what is it we're doing um, at HHS, and I'll end with some of what we're doing at the Innovation Center. I'm going to break all the rules and give you way too much information in only an hour. But the bottom line is, I, at the end of our hour together, what I want you to see is kind of how payment is changing. And, you know, as a clinician, I never thought I'd be working for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. But this opportunity to change payment, meaning there's an opportunity to change care delivery, is what I think is so exciting. And if you change payment and the care does not get delivered any differently, it's kind of like, why bother? So the reason that we're doing this payment change is to create a different a care delivery model and well as, as, as improving um, outcomes. Um, so first a little bit about Medicaid and kind of how it fits into the big picture of um, payment. The, the circle on the left is the number of people covered and the amount of money of expenditures is on the right. And you can see I pulled out Medicaid in both. Uh, Medicaid now covering 70 million people is bigger than Medicare and marketplace combined and is, um, I think, bigger than the largest private sector health insurer. So it's a huge swath of um, how we're covering folks now in the United States. And it also means when we start to talk about delivery system reform, you can't really talk about reforming the entire system unless you talk about how we're going to reform Medicaid as well. Nearly half of all births um, are in the country are covered by um, Medicaid, especially half of uh, low-income kids. Um, no, over half of all births in the United States, and that's been for a long time, and it's kind of amazing when you think about it. Half of all births in the United States are covered by Medicaid. The, the implications that that has and what we can do to try to help improve birth outcomes is monstrous. Over a third of all children in the United States are covered by Medicaid, um, half of low-income children, and 21% of Medicare beneficiaries are also covered by Medicaid, which we call dual beneficiaries, so they're lower-income Medicare beneficiaries. Um, Part of, a lot of what we've been doing since the passage of the Affordable Care Act is increasing coverage. Um, you know, the Affordable Care Act created the marketplace for those that were in the, the private market um, in the individual market, and it expanded Medicaid. Uh, when the law first passed, it required all states to expand Medicaid. And you'll remember in the first Supreme Court decision, um, that was the one piece that did not stay, that, that the Supreme Court decided that we could not mandate that states um, expand their Medicaid program. So now we've got 32 states, including D.C., that have expanded. There's still um, a few states there that have not. But one of the things that we've just spent, spent so much time doing over the past number of years is making sure that where we could get extra folks covered, that's kind of your, that's your ticket in the door, getting coverage. Um, and we've been pretty successful, especially for children. Um, Back in 2008, there was a little over 9% of kids that were uninsured. Now in 2014, you can see we're down to only 6% of kids uh, not having health insurance. And having insurance, though, doesn't really, you know, doesn't necessarily guarantee you have good health care coverage. Part of the problem and part of what we've been doing at the Innovation Center is we started on the left with a system that was very producer or provider-centered. Um, we pay in a fee-for-service world. We pay for just doing more. It doesn't matter if the patient gets better. As long as you do more, you get paid more. So the quality, quantity over the quality. And what we've been trying to do at the Innovation Center is fund new models of care delivery um, that will reward the value, reward quality, and, and incentivize um, different payment models that will ultimately have improved outcomes for patients. 
And there in the lower right-hand corner, the kinds of things that we're doing is looking to have better value-based purchasing. Um, the creation of ACOs, it seems such a, for me at least, it seems um, a term we use all the time, and it's uh, interesting to think that eight years ago that term didn't even exist of what an accountable care organization was. Episode-based payments, um, medical homes, primarily primary care, and quality and cost transparency. So after we spent all this time making sure people had coverage, uh, Secretary uh, Burwell, um, three years ago, charged us with thinking about how we can make a better, smarter, healthier healthcare delivery system. Uh, better care, smarter spending, and healthier people. And so um, this is about a year and a half ago, although the Innovation Center's been, been working on this, we kind of looked across all of HHS to see <laughs> Excuse me. Um, how we could do, better, do a better job really reforming the healthcare delivery system. And we decided there were three specific areas that we could be looking at where we had lots of tools in our toolbox that we could actually start to do a better job. How we pay providers can be different. The care delivery models can be different and how we distribute information. Much of the information that we use to monitor success, to figure out if patients are doing well, has been owned or in some way um, the United States the federal government has, has a, a, stay, a say in that data. So how can we do a better job making that information um, get out to providers as well as patients? So this is a really busy slide. And so the gist of this slide is um, when we're talking about payment reform, you'll see the four different categories, category one, two, three, and four. We look to see how we could move away from fee-for-service, which is that, that kind of, uh, column to the left, and how we could move towards ultimately a population-based payment. And the, the first category there is um, just paying for value without any, paying for volume, volume without any link to quality. And that's where we pretty much started, that all payment was just, we will pay you if you do and submit a service, not necessarily linked to quality. As you move across the continuum there, category two is you'll get paid if you can demonstrate that you've got certain metrics that you're showing that you're demonstrating are being improved. The third category there is still based on the fee-for-service infrastructure, but it is looking to change the way we're putting those pieces together. So a shared savings model, where if you do a better job and ultimately save money over time, the federal government gets half the savings and you get half the savings, but only if you can demonstrate that the quality incentive's there too, because we can all think about if you just stinted care and you save money if the patient isn't getting better, that's, that's an easier way to go. And then ultimately, um, category four, population-based payment or a global global capitation. And then we've got examples in Medicare and Medicaid of how we're trying to move through that continuum. So we set goals, Secretary Barrow set goals for us, um, and we're trying to get in um, the FAR section, um, categories three and four, 30% of our payments in 2016, and we want to get 50% of our payments there by 2018. And the goal of just linking payment to quality, so in categories two, three, or four, we want to get 85% now, 90%, because we think that everyone has to be moving towards some kind of linking quality. And uh, so historical performance and where we're headed. So but you can see the third circle there. In 2016, our goal was 30%. Um, in categories two and four and 85 percent, and we've actually already met that um, through our estimating how states are doing, how the federal government is doing, how Medicare is doing. We expect you to get there by the end of 2016, and we, um, I think in end of February, we announced, we realized that we had gotten there already. So we think we're on target to be able to get to um, the 50 percent and the 90 percent. But it can't just be Medicare alone. It's got to be what we're trying to do is really have that tipping point, be to have enough payers, enough consumers, enough folks thinking this is the right way to go. Because uh, folks like uh, you who are um, looking forward and being innovative and changing some of your payment models, that's great. But there are a lot of folks that are doing well in fee-for-service. And how do we move the needle to make sure that everyone is moving in that direction and it's not just the good guys making the change and then the rest of the folks are still in that uh, fee-for-service model? And I put this slide in because this is a slide to show um, to the far left, it starts at 1995. And in 1995, 82% of, in Medicaid, 82% of the long-term services and support were in institutions, and only 18% were in home and community-based services. 
And over time, you see now um, in 2013, 51% of services are in the home in community-based services and only 49% are in institutions. And I put this on here to show that Medicaid, first of all, is flexible enough that we've been looking to do this for a long time, even before this kind of more recent charge of value-based purchasing. And also the incremental, how every year it was a little bit in the right direction. And this is the way we think that if, if you've got the eye on the prize, this is better for providers. Certainly, it was better for patients. We heard patients over and over again saying, I don't want to be an institution. I want to be in my home or in a community-based setting. And so we've been able to see over the past two decades, we've made some strong, um, some strong change in the way we've been paying for um, long-term services. So in order to have it be not just CMS and not just Medicare doing this, we created the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, which we call the LAN, the Learning and Action Network. If any of you are interested in seeing what we're doing as we're partnering with um, lots of different stakeholders, specifically looking at the private sector, working closely with states and Medicaid, but we've got lots of consumer groups. Um, as we set this goal for Medicare fee-for-service to move away from fee to move away from fee-for-service, we wanted to make sure that we were engaging a much broader swath of the population. And um, we now have, I think here, yeah, 4,800 registered participants in the Learning and Action Network. I think it might even be higher now. And you can see the list there of the white papers because if everyone is approaching this differently, it's going to be crazy for providers. It's going to be crazy for hospitals to think everyone's paying me differently for this. And fee-for-service, at least you knew everyone was doing it the same way. So we started with what is an alternative payment model? What is it that we think counts as an alternative payment model? And that was the first paper that they put out, this Learning and Action Network, uh, passed it around, had people comment on it. And I think we've got 11 of the biggest 18 private sectors. And now we, we start to go through more of the, the nuts and bolts. Patient attribution, is it um, a, a prospective, is it a retrospective? So some of the weeds, but it's also saying we're doing it this way in Medicare, in CMS, what's the private sector doing? What are you doing out in the, in the uh, individual markets? And you can see at the end we're looking at what a maternity bundle is, what a cardiac care bundle is, and we're trying to just get this sense across all of the payers, all of the consumers, is there some kind of consensus? <laughs> nothing required here, nothing mandatory, just saying this is what we're doing, we'd like to know what you're doing, can you comment on this? One of the things that has changed recently that it's actually going to move towards this voluntary is this mandatory. So MACRA, <coughs> I don't have any, you have to count how many slides I have to stop and call. MACRA, you might remember, is one of the very few things that um, had a strong bipartisan support in Congress last year. And it was a law, and I won't get into the details. If anyone has questions later, um, I'd be happy to answer them. But the reason I bring this up is because MACRA is a law that's changing how Medicare beneficiaries will get reimbursed in terms of incentives. And it's also giving more incentives to a provider that decides they want to be in a very rigorous alternative payment model. So we had CMS doing it in the Innovation Center. Then we had this Learning and Action Network saying, hey, how are we all thinking about this? Um, and now we're moving towards it will be a, a requirement. So when I showed you those goals before, by 2016 and 2018, of the 30% in Categories 3 and 4 and the 85% in Categories 2, 3, and 4, the two big parts of uh, MACRA was this merit-based incentive program, which is going to give providers extra um, financial incentives if they are demonstrating certain quality measures, and they will take away certain uh, amounts of money. So in the first year, you can get a 4% bump, or you could lose 4% of your Medicare dollars if you're not meeting certain quality measures. And then the second is this alternative payment model where we're really looking to have folks get to that categories three and four, a really rigorous alternative payment model. And if they do that, they get an automatic bump. And this is what Congress has passed. So it's been really interesting to see it kind of coming together. What I think this represents is a tipping point of folks that were the good guys saying, yes, I'll take the risk, I'll move away from fee-for-service, and I'll jump into this alternative payment model. Now we see the private sector moving, the laws moving, and, and we think that we're going to be at, at a place where we can um, better make the change in payment, which, again, we hope then ultimately creates a better health care delivery system. So I'm going to end with just some models um, that we're working on at the Innovation Center, and then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end. So many of you may know that the Affordable Care Act created language um, that would create this um, Center for Innovation. And um, in quotes there, we've taken right from the Affordable Care Act, the purpose of the center is to test innovative payment and service delivery models that would reduce program expenditures while preserving or enhancing the quality of care. And 
we then we have very rigorous evaluation for every model that we do, and um, we then have our actuaries at the end of year to year uh, assess to see have we been able to demonstrate cost savings or budget neutrality while we're also looking at improved patient outcomes. Then the exciting thing is if the secretary finds that this is in fact a model that has been able to demonstrate cost savings and quality, then the secretary has the authority to put that into policies at Medicare or Medicaid. The reason that's important is because before that, if, if CMS did a demonstration, it usually came through Congress, so Congress had to do this exact three-year demonstration. Then when it was over, it had to go back to Congress, and Congress had to decide whether or not we could move forward. Well, it was hard to convince providers to make the big change like that, do it for three years, if then you had to wait to go back to Congress to see if that was going to end up being passed. So this is a new model that, um, that we're allowed to look at some very strong measures, but then if those measures can prove that they are doing what we set out to do, then uh, we are allowed at CMS to be able to make those changes. And it started to happen already. Our Pioneer ACO program, that has been demonstrated to um, to move the needle, and so some of the things that we're learning in the Pioneer ACO program we're putting into Medicare policy. Part of every um, model, as I mentioned, is both um, a strong evaluation as well as a strong learning and diffusion activities. Um, what we realized is if we're going to test this model and it's going to be on a three-year model on this subset, if we're going to make some policy changes later, we better realize how it is we're doing, what it is we're doing, and how can we look at scaling and spreading. That's not always so easy. You have a model that was tested in one place. How do we make sure that the scale or the, 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 the spread and the scale of that model is true to what it is that they were uh, testing in the beginning? And the activities there at the bottom are some of the major activities that we've been doing, and we pick and choose how these learning action um, networks can, can take place. Um, with the accountable care communities, we had some very rigorous um, learning collaboratives there. Um, there's a learning infrastructure for partnerships for patient, and I've been running um, monthly calls and in-person meetings for our pediatric awardees uh, for, I guess, about the past three years. I was, in part, um, afraid that children and Medicaid would get lost in the world of Medicare, so we started to organize and um, bring together some of our, Medi our uh, Medicaid pediatric providers. The rapid cycle evaluation was different about this of what we're doing now is, again, um, the way CMS did evaluations before, they oftentimes did the evaluation on the three-year program, then spent the next year analyzing the data, and then in year four, they would have announced what it is they learned, and then kind of deciding whether or not they would move forward uh, with, making, with, with being able to recommend scale or spread. What we've been doing is making it rapid cycle. So every year we release preliminary findings. So a three-year program, year one, year two, year three, we're going to start to, to release preliminary findings. So the researchers in the room, you know that after a year we probably can't say um, whether or not this is uh, the, the, the findings we necessarily wanted to, but you can start to see directionality. You can start to see some things that um, made sense to be able to get that information up. I, I was extraordinarily, I was a, I'm a, a kind of a, a latent uh, health services researcher, did much of that um, in the beginning of my career, and have been really uh, impressed at the rigor of the evaluation of, of what we're doing for each of these models. And it's expensive. It's one of the things that is a big benefit of being able to participate in one of our um, the, the Innovation Center Awards because any kind of a really rigorous evaluation, as you know, is extraordinarily expensive, and the fact that we build that into every model is quite exciting. Again, way too busy. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, these are the models that we have now going on at the Innovation Center. When I started there five years ago, it was empty. didn't have any models. And so this is what we've been working on over the past number of years. And I showed you here, I broke it up into how we pay providers, how we deliver care, so are we creating new care delivery models, and then how we're distributing information. And you'll remember they were the three different target areas that we identified that we could at CMS, at HHS, help move the needle. I highlighted in red um, the models that focus on kids. There's not a whole lot there, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through some of those models, and then we'll talk about some of the opportunities at the end. So we've got Strong Start. I spent about six months working on Strong Start. We call them Strategy 1 and Strategy 2 um, when I early on, I guess, in the first year that I was there. Um, 
the first couple of things that we did, I'll go back to here. The first couple of things that we did were things that were in the law. The law said you had to do an accountable care organization. The law said you had to do bundles. The law said you had to do primary care medical. So we kind of got started there too. And then the next step was um, Don Berwick, who was our director of CMS at the time, said, what do we know about care that we think we really can make it move the needle on? And folks said, um, prematurity. How can we decrease prematurity? Not only is there an immediate cost savings because we decrease NICU stays, uh, which isn't always so good for the bottom line in um, hospitals, but also the ramifications for children and families. It's not just uh, the, the illness of the child who's premature. There is a lifetime of um, of effects, and um, the Institute of Medicine and, uh, had, did, a, did a fabulous report as well as others to look at what those long-term implications are. I was especially interested in um, in looking at this because when I was at, um, Dr. Thiedem said I was at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, when I was there, there was a woman named Dottie Bruton, and I, was, I remember when I was starting to get into research, she did a randomized control trial that got published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a nurse and a nursing set of researchers looking at uh, what we could do to have babies leave the NICU earlier. And she brought nurses in, nurses worked with the parents, nurses worked with the babies, and she found significantly, if you did this, we could have uh, babies leave the NICU significantly uh, sooner, significantly fewer days in the NICU. Nothing ever changed in the years that passed. And so why is that? There was no financial incentive to move kids out of the NICU, right? I mean, when you're looking at the bottom line, the NICUs were often uh, the cost center trying to help cover what we were losing in, um, in the emergency room. Not that it was deliberate necessarily, but there was no real incentive to, to move the needle on that. Um, but we know that there's things that you could do. Dottie Bruton's paper, I think, was in the mid-1980s and had never um, changed there. So we looked at two different ways that we could uh, start to move the needle on prematurity. The first was interesting because we didn't pay folks. Um, the second one was a model where we actually um, had people re re uh, a request for um, proposals and we actually paid new models. We looked at three things that were in our toolbox already. We could promote awareness, spread best practices, and promote transparency. And what we decided to do with prematurity at this point was look specifically, how do we, do, how do we reduce early elective deliveries? Everyone knows, and I think you actually had a talk today about um, how 40 weeks, and there's all sorts of wonderful slogans that I'm not remembering any of them now. But we knew that this was the case, and what was it that we could do um, at CMS to try to make this uh, to make this happen? Promoting awareness, we worked really closely. We knew not to recreate the wheel. CMS has no business doing a lot of this kind of um, strategy. Um, so promoting awareness, we worked with the March of Dimes and the American um, ACOG. Childbirth Connections and other organizations to, um, to get the word out that um, at least 39, if not 40 or 41 weeks, spreading best practices. And I highlighted their partnerships for patients because with this one, the way we spread best practices, we actually worked with another model that we were funding called Partnerships for Patients that were doing hospital-based um, in, um, inter interventions. And we worked with them and asked them to specifically look at early elective deliveries. And I'll show you what happened there. And then promoting transparency, just having people talk about what their rate of early elective deliveries was. And it was, um, it was, it was a time that, that we were looking at that across lots of different sectors, but um, we've made some enormous strides there. The second strong start, is, strong start strategy was um, looking to provide enhanced prenatal services. Um, and looked at the literature to figure what was it that we could do that would enhance pre uh, prenatal services that would decrease prematurity over time. And we actually found four different approaches. There's three on here now. The first was there was a subset of literature that said the care delivered in birth centers tended to uh, result less often in a premature birth. Care delivered through group prenatal care or centering um, was another approach to the delivery of prenatal care. It was a little bit more expensive because of the way that they organized it, so we, we could pay a little bit more there. And then care delivered in a maternity care home, and we identified some of the things that needed to be considered to be a, a maternity care home. The fourth um, area that we actually worked closely with HRSA was um, looking at home uh, nurse visitation programs. We knew that that was something that could ultimately decrease prematurity if done in a certain way. HRSA was doing it already, so we worked with them to help enhance their evaluation so they could look to see if prematurity was something they could move the needle on. Um, and we, this is, we, don't, we don't have the full um, evaluation yet, but this is one of those places in our first two years we have started to see fewer uh, C-sections, increased um, 
uh, breastfeeding and starting to see uh, fewer uh, prematurity, premature births. One of the things here, so we're always looking at Medicaid to figure out, now what can we be doing? Medicaid is different than Medicare. CMS can make a, a policy change with Medicare and say, let's pay, let's change the way we pay for things. With, C, with Medicaid, we allow states to, to take up um, the offer of how they want to be doing, delivering the care, and then we partner with them. We pay between 75 or 50 percent of the, of the federal match. And so one of the things that we just did recently at the beginning of March is working with HRSA, we identified in states that are doing a better job paying for these home visitation programs, we outlined the different mechanisms and provided that back to states and said, you're participating in the HRSA program, but if you wanted to do it a, a better, if you wanted to cover more folks, the HRSA program is smaller, if you wanted to cover more folks, here are ways that we have had other states um, be able to start to fund this uh, through their Medicaid program. And it's also, it's been interesting that we did this with HRSA, so that we always look for opportunities to have it not just come from Medicaid, but where can the different what, where silos of federal government start to work together. The Partnerships for Patients, which I mentioned, we use this to look at our Strong Start Strategy 1. This was also one of the first models that we did, and the goal here was to decrease preventable hospital-acquired conditions by 40% in three years, which was huge. This was also something that, that Don Berwick was um, extraordinarily um, passionate about trying to make happen. And so what we did here was we identified 10 different areas that hospitals could do a better job decreasing hospital-acquired conditions. And we didn't tell them which, which measure to use in these 10 areas. We let them do that, and then we did a lot of learning and, learning and diffusion, a lot of learning between the different hospitals, except for obstetrical care. Obstetrical care, we said every hospital that participates in this program will look at early elective delivery as the thing that you want to move the needle on. In addition to, we have um, uh, 26 hospital engagement networks that were part of this. They represented 85 to 90 percent of all hospitals in the country, and there was one of the 26 that was a specific children's hospital um, uh, group, and over 80 children's hospitals were part of that. So they were also working in this learning and diffusion group. And um, this is what we found over the first three years. The model has since been, um, since been expanded. And um, the data showed that we decreased by 17% hospital-acquired conditions. They estimated that was 50,000 lives saved, um, 1.3 million adverse events avoided, probably a savings of up to $12 billion. But in the, the bottom line there, the second one is what I wanted to show you, that over the time that we were doing this, early elective delivery decreased by over 70%. Now, of course, it wasn't just us doing this, but this partnering with, with um, lots of other clinician groups and hospital groups, the fact that we've been able to decrease early elective delivery by 70% is just amazing, and not necessarily lots of money. It's one of those things that we call awareness to it. We have leadership at hospitals that want to make make some policies to make that happen. We didn't pay any differently, Medicare, Medicaid, for any of these. We just kind of um, alerted hospitals this is what we wanted to be doing. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple different models, and then um, I think we'll have time to, to um, ask questions. The Healthcare Innovation Award. So I said we started paying, we started doing models at the Innovation Center with ACOs and bundled payments and things that the law said. And then we went to where do we think we can move the needle, and that's where we had prematurity. The next kind of group of models that we did was we were hearing from providers that said, listen, we know what to do. The problem is in many instances you and your policies are standing in the way. And if you would just change something and do something a little bit different, we could probably do a better job. And so we embarked then on um, the first round, we didn't know it was round one at the time, of the Healthcare Innovation Awards. And um, it was a billion dollars, 107 projects. And basically what we asked folks to tell us is, you show us how you think you can improve quality, decrease cost, smarter spending, look at the workforce, and we will then decide if we think that this model is something that um, we can move forward with. With Medicaid, again, there was lots of flexibility, so we were hoping sustainability could occur in the Medicaid program. With Medicare, we would even consider doing some kind of a waiver if there was a policy in place that was not able to um, have you be able to do the care that you, were, you wanted to be providing. One of the examples I'll give you there is, um, I don't have a slide, I, I didn't put that slide in, but we have a program called Independence at Home. And I had actually worked on that, this when it was a, um, a law being uh, developed in Congress. And it was a bunch of home care docs who said, we would like to be able to provide primary care to frail elders in their home. 
And there's a rule in Medicaid, Medicare that says you cannot get reimbursed unless for primary care services and other services unless they come into the office. And they said, we know that we can save money. We can, over time, if we can uh, go to the folks' home, we are willing to do it. We are home care docs. Um, and we know that these folks can stay in their home. There's less falls. We can do a better job monitoring them in the home. But there is a regulation in place that prevents us from doing this. So we started a program called Independence at Home. That's now, I think, almost nearing its third year. And that also has started to show, and it's also doctors and nurse practitioners when it got passed, um, being able to provide primary care in the home and some of these things, like we call it innovative, and when you think about how care delivery used to be, a lot of this stuff doesn't feel so innovative. What's innovative is the fact that we're willing to pay for these things differently. These are things that intuitively folks knew if we could only use telemedicine different, if we could only communicate via email or via text message, we'd be able to do this in a, a more cost-effective way. So the round one of the Healthcare Innovation Awards, um, we products in all 50 states, and we had a, a handful of pediatric providers they were kind of all over the map doing diabetes or asthma. Some were doing ACOs, some were doing chronically ill, um, but they were pretty much scattered in, in the way that they were, uh, they were providing care to kids. And this is when I um, started to organize them when we started to do these monthly calls and had some in-person meetings. When it came time to do round two, we decided we wanted to focus our portfolio on the things that were missing. And because we had been tracking what was happening in Medicaid and Peas, we were able to also highlight, guess what, there's not a whole lot of stuff going on here. So we looked at four specific areas that we wanted to fund. In the first one, it was just generally, can you improve quality and decrease cost? We wanted to reduce Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP expenditures, mostly in the outpatient or post-acute setting, because we had done a lot of inpatient the first time around. We wanted to improve care for populations with specialized needs, and this is where we specifically called out kids. Uh, transforming financial and clinical models, and we wanted to look more of a population health model, so more of the wellness and the health. This is where the folks that we're working with at um, Children's Hospital, and they're part of the CARE Award, which is an award that um, is, was applied for by the Children's Hospital Association, and there's 10 different children's hospitals uh, looking at kids with medical complexity. And we have about six other models that are also looking at medical complexity. So we're able to kind of focus in a little bit and learn a little bit more about what we're doing for these kids who are high spenders, but we actually don't know a whole lot about who these kids are necessarily. Uh, when we look across our models, some people, some of the awards are um, identifying them as the top 20% of spenders, some are looking at the top 5% of spenders, and some are looking at the top 1%. And we also know that the top 1% of spenders account for 30% of all pediatric um, costs healthcare costs, as well as 55% of all hospitals um, stays in children's hospitals. So better understanding how providers generally across the nation are identifying medical complexity, what are the measures we should be using, what's the payment model? If fee-for-service isn't working for these kids, um, what's the payment model? Although there might be some savings, for the most part, children in general just can't generate the same kind of savings with adults because kids are just healthier. And so what does that mean as we're trying to think of more, uh, more models for, for pediatrics? Another one of the Healthcare Innovation Awards in that fourth bucket where I said wanted to focus on population health or wellness, uh, we had uh, an award, the uh, YMCA was looking at do the, doing a diabetes prevention program. And so with the diabetes prevention program, as we collected data um, in, the, in the states where they were working, we then had those actuaries I talked about before. If the actuary can find that it decreases cost and improves quality, we then can move forward with being able to better pay for, for um, a, a population or a, a new intervention. And in fact, the Diabetes Prevention Program was the first program that we were able to demonstrate in a preventive way was able to move the needle there. And right now, Medicare does not pay for diabetes prevention programs, and now we're going to move forward to be able to consider possibly paying for this because we've had the data that showed that we were successful here. Um, two more slides. Uh, this is one of our newest models, Accountable Health Communities. And in this model, we've um, started to look at some of the social issues, some of the social determinants. Each of the applicants in this award needs to partner with Medicaid because, again, Medicaid's flexibility. Medicaid can pay for all sorts of things that may not have been traditionally considered clinical. And there's three different tracks. Um, each will be randomized, uh, a randomized control track. Um, the first track is just making folks aware of the kinds of um, community-based services that are available to them. The second track would be we're actually assisting you when you come in to be able to get those services. And the third track is we're going to officially align with some of these community-based um, 
providers to be able to help move the needle and look at um, and then study some of the effects of the um, social determinants of health. And I think this is my, yeah, this is my last slide. One of the other things that we're doing just generally, because we know it's not easy for providers to make some of the changes that are required, so we're doing this Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, which isn't about a specific model. This is just providers that want to do a better job getting the data, turning those numbers into real information that I can use, um, looking at some learning and diffusion activities that before this had been just specifically linked to a model. This is now just general clinicians that want to figure out how they can survive in this new care delivery system um, that is going to be moving away from fee-for-service. And so this has been um, exciting trying to figure out how we can just help general providers do a better job. And so last is what we're asking for you to help us do. Um, Many of these things you probably have opportunities to do and are probably in the midst of doing them, eliminating patient harm, focus on better care, smarter spending, and how we can create healthier fa children and families, um, engage in different kinds of alternative payment models uh, where possible, investing in the quality infrastructure, we know that's expensive, focusing on data, making those data available to um, improve transparency, help us develop new models. And I know that the folks at the, um, that are part of our care, the CARE Award, we have these calls where we're trying to figure out. So we're learning from folks that are going through this to help figure out what is it we could be do, doing differently. I know I've spoken to some folks here that have been working with asthma and working with schools. And we actually, I, I've taken some tips that I've gotten and I've shared that with other folks. And, and, we know that we don't have all the information at the Innovation Center or at CMS, and so we really do appreciate hearing how folks have captured some of these um, challenges, what you've done, and how you've started to move the needle. Um, and that's my information. And um, I think I still have a fair amount of time, and so I'd love to engage this group in um, talking a little bit more about what you heard, how you think you're already doing some of these things, some of the challenges that you think um, that you're facing as you're moving through this. Um, I just wanted to kind of follow up because I think, you know, um, we so, let me just say thank you for being a pediatric you know, for us. Um, it's just, it's so appreciated. And I think what you said in terms of, um, oh, I'm sorry, the in, um, inability to get the financial outcomes just because it's a smaller, you know, it's a smaller, very diverse, healthier group of patients. Um, how is CMS going to be approaching that? Um, because we know there are pockets, um, but we also know that where the, the larger bandwidth in terms of financial savings is with the elderly population. Right. It's a really good question. And <laughs> a couple of things. Um, you saw on the one slide that I said success is not, even, not necessarily savings, but it can be cost neutrality when you've seen quality go up. And what we found is many of the early adopters, folks that we're working with, are actually able to find <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> opportunities where they can you know, decrease in a few stays. Um, decreasing some surgical admissions, really um, interestingly looking. Um, the folks that were able to do that um, were, in some cases, both payer and provider. So they had those data, so it's easier for them. Uh, Denver Health, who's a payer and a provider, they've got all, they know the utilization, the nationwide children, they have, a, they have full risk for 20% uh, of their population, they've had it for like 20 years. So those data are really important because there's probably some things that you can be doing which is not so evident, and if you could better understand that. Um, one of the things that we're doing with the CARE Award is um, trying to make sure that um, the awardees have access to actuaries. I don't think there is a single actuary in the United States that is not employed anymore after what we, the work that we're doing. Because better understanding how how the more expensive kids are going through the uh, the healthcare system is fascinating. I don't know whether you know um, uh, a physician Jay Berry um, who's done just amazing work, and he looks at these trajectory of these kids, and they all get better at a certain time regardless of the intervention. So, what should we do if they're going to have this curve, and how do we intervene on there? So, it's a it's an important issue. The other thing that you didn't mention but goes along the line with it is the longitudinality of it. And so part of what we're also thinking of is we measure something in three years. How do we start to measure not only in a longer period of time but perhaps outside the typical clinical wall? So if you're doing a good job having kids be ready for school and there are some children's hospitals are starting to look at that, some of these other school readiness reading, um, it doesn't feel like it's necessarily something we can do we can really move the needle in pediatrics, but in fact, 
there are certain things that we can be doing to do a better job, too. So I think it's even more important to look at some of those other social issues when you're talking about a pediatric population and seeing if there's other things that we can be counting. The next question is, of course, who counts it? If you're just looking at the healthcare delivery system and they're only saving money and they're not working with the schools, it doesn't matter if the schools do better. So one of our other models, the state innovation model, we on purpose gave the money to the states and the governor's office because when an intervention happens in one silo but the savings is in another silo, what do we do with that? That's not easy. Um, but like one example is we found um, a small study, so not really sure, but Meals on Wheels, you know, which is a meal program for the frail elders. They found that with frail elders that get meals on wheels, they have less post-acute care or nursing home visits. Kind of makes sense. Someone comes to your house, social isolation brings you food, you don't have to go to um, um, a nursing home. But the healthcare delivery system pays for the nursing homes. The funding for the home visiting program, for the uh, meals on wheels, is over in this program. So what happens when an intervention is in one silo and the outcome is another one? So it's, 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 there, and there's fascinating work that's starting to think about that. But it's a great point. Thank you. And what are you um, what are you expecting the impact of ICD-10 implementation to be on this whole process? Any any predictions? I don't have an answer for the second one. Yeah. Um, I know that there's um, lots of work being done at CMS to try to make this happen. What I hope will occur from that, as well as the electronic medical records, is starting to capture some of these things, some of the patient outcomes, patient changes that we couldn't capture in regular fee-for-service or with former coding. And as you have more codes, we can actually start to move the needle on or start to look to see where the needle is being moved. So with the electronic health records, uh, as we move away from claims-based fee-for-service, we're not going to, before we could say if you did this, you then had this decreased utilization because we could, with, with the claims we could demonstrate what you did. That's not going to be there if we move to global capitation, right? So we're going to say here you had a per beneficiary per month amount of money and did that work. So with the electronic medical record, hopefully you'll be able to capture what the interventions were doing. Now, part of the problem is there's lots of different models out there. I don't know whether you heard, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get it right. I can get back to you, but at... Um, um, HIMSS, which was the big um, health information systems meeting that happened probably six weeks ago, there was a big initiative that many of the big um, electronic health record companies came together and said they will start to look, be more uniform in the kinds of data that they're collecting. And there was a small amount uh, when they first, I was just talking to someone who was at the meeting and they said when they first announced it, there was just a small group that had signed on and a lot of other folks said there's no way that you're going to get the rest of the folks to sign on. But they got the right number in that first small group. And by the time the conference ended, like three or four days later, they had huge numbers of people that signed on to say, let's look to see how can we have this be um, more similar and more comparable. So hopefully stay tuned. This work is tremendously exciting and it, again, shows the role of the federal government in identifying the gaps and serving as a catalyst. There is so much misinformation out there about the ACA and I don't know the visibility of the Innovation Center to the public. So my question is what is HHS doing to communicate? I know this is some premature data, but it's still phenomenally exciting work to improve the health of the public. So is part of all of this a strategy to inform the public and our Congress? Yeah. Um so you may know that Patrick Conway is now our director at the Innovation Center. Well, I actually, I, I turned it into a verb. The fact that I've got two jobs, I'm the senior advisor as well as the chief population health officer at Medicaid, I'm Patrick Conwaying because he keeps adding titles and doesn't give the other ones up. So he started at our Center for Clinical Quality Standards as the chief medical officer there. Then he came to the Innovation Center, and now he's also the deputy administrator at, at CMS, and he's still doing all of these and is a pediatrician by training. Um, there was a very notable increase in publications that we did when he came on board. Before, it was very difficult to get a publication through the major clearance process. And he has, I think, seen the importance of that. And so with every now, with every new model that we get out, there's almost always a JAMA or a Health Affairs or a New England Journal article that's going out with that. So it's a certain population 
providers um, that we're uh, marketing, we're talking to, but at least we've seen that be a big difference. I can tell you with the law that I mentioned, the MACRA, it's going to be this brand new way of changing um, how we're paying for Medicare providers, but I think we'll ultimately have some implications for Medicaid. There is a tremendous amount of work going on. I've been uh, working with um, kind of our, our, our outreach team on um, creating apps or how per perhaps to understand where you fit in as a clinician in this new model. Lots of focus groups with physicians to better understand. But it's always a challenge. It's much easier, as you all know, if there's one line you can put on the top of the New York Times that says, this is very scary, don't you agree? I mean, it took me, there's a lot of content here. This is a complicated issue. And I think clinicians can help. And I think, you know, we love going around and talking to folks so that you can hear the work that we're doing. You ultimately become the spokesman for patients in many instances. Uh, we want a patient to say, I feel like I'm getting care differently now in this ACO than I did before. We want providers to be able to say, I'm, I'm practicing differently because of this, and, and get that information through. Um, also, I think we'd be interested, we work with AARP and some of these folks, but we, if folks have ideas of how we could do a better job, I think we'd love to hear about them. Dr. Webb, um, first of all, thank you for your uh, passion and leadership uh, uh, here. And, uh, <laughs> it's uh, great to hear you uh, acknowledge the solutions for patient safety, which we're a part of, yeah. and also the uh, CMMI grant with the nine other uh, children's hospitals, and some of the people that run that are, right. Are, are, are right over there. And also Dr. Conway, who's on our medical staff yeah. and uh, sees patients on the weekends, and we don't have to pay him. So. There was just an article. Did you see the article? I think it was... Yeah, no, I was quoted. I didn't even know he was working here when I ran into him on the elevator. It's, uh, it's not a good feeling for a CEO to, to have that uh, happen. Um, uh, so it's great work. Uh, the thing I worry about, and, and maybe you could backtrack to one of your slides, you showed the uh, number of kids that are covered and then the, um, the amount of money that goes to those uh, the kids. uninsured kids? The four, it goes 48%, I think, but it's only 25% of the... This? Yeah, that one. This one here? So you yep. look at the, uh, you know, uh, Medicaid is the primary uh, insurer for, for kids, and it's really, a, uh, you know, it's, it's all about access. And, and then when you look at the Medicaid program and the spend there, it's become more and more around the disabled, the elderly, and the adults. Right. And... Um, at the Children's Hospital Association and all the other children's hospitals, uh, we're, we're very worried because um, CHIP is set to expire in two years. Um, hope may, maybe it'll get extended, but the um, exchanges haven't really, aren't robust around children, and uh, there's a lot of worry. Uh, the maintenance of effort uh, goes away. Um, so there's a perfect storm happening uh, or about or down the line in, in two or three years uh, where our, um, you know, the main um, uh, coverage for, for children uh, could just implode. Uh, so how do, you, how do you look at that? I mean, these, these pilot programs and the, are, are just fa fabulous, but the basic structure of state-based programs that are very, and then the, uh, the increasing, it seems to me we, we need a national Medicare program for kids. Uh, that would be independent and would be focused on kids. Do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> There's always a thought of trying to have kind of a universal coverage for kids. And I know that when I was working at a think tank um, and at one point when it looked like the Affordable Care Act may not be moving forward because of things that were happening, they said maybe we should just do general health care for kids generally. Um, so as a pediatric provider, um, I think covering kids would be a great idea. I mean, we have EPSDT. That's kind of the closest that we came to. So everybody in Medicaid, regardless of the state, you should have this set of services, and that was kind of a, a way to, to be uniform. Part of it, though, is uh, we build a system based on the system that we had, right? That's, that's the way you, we move forward. And um, legislation is, that, you know, that's a major piece of legislation to make something like that happen. And um, those things are, are hard to get through. I think um, looking at where we can have uni 
policies that are similar for kids, but that's only kids that are covered. I mean, as you point out, if, if CHIP's going to go away, um, you know, we keep our branches of government separate, though, and I'm in the administration, and of course, that's Congress. Um, and so we can't um, recommend what Congress would do. But I think um, you're, you point out um, a really important um, a coverage piece. I, I thought maybe you were going to say, you know, the other piece that is kids that can't show that they've got documentation. And that's, that's another, when you look at the percentage of kids that are uninsured, there's still that 6%, many of them are um, not documented. And so that's another issue, that there's a, a fair swath of those kids that don't have coverage. But um, it means that there's lots more work for the next administration to come in and try to, to look at that. But you make a really great point. Dr. Whelan, well, I'm so appreciative of what you've done. And one of the things that her talk exemplifies is that policy is the primary determinant of health. And as many of you know, I go around to many venues saying why policy and how we all as clinicians must understand health policy and national policy. And this is a classic example of how many people know this significant component of the ACA and the potential of this and what happens as it moves forward with the elections in November of what will of this will expand or go away. So again, trying once again for every one of you here is that you must understand the context of policy and how it is affecting your practice, and it's the primary determinant of health. And we all need uh, to be on board on that. And I just think uh, Dr. Whelan's presentation showing the critical nature of having a clinical person, a scientist, at the top policy-making levels in the country. And she has been with other fine PhDs, I know, where they're told they have to go to academia and not waste their PhD. And I've been an advocate of saying, this is not wasting good science and doctoral preparation. So I thank you all so much and uh, for joining us today. And then there's a recap with Dr. Kelly right now. So again, thank you, Dr. Whalen. This is such a great way to end our day today. And I, I have the great privilege of kind of recapping what we've been what we've been hearing today and, and the great fun and the great things that we've learned. And I want to first start by thanking Eileen Eng and the planning committee for putting this together. It's been a great day, hasn't it, everyone? I just really think really thank you. We also want to really thank our AV specialists. We would not be able to go forward without you backing us up all day long, and we thank you as well, as well as for all the planners for this great week. We're in our second day, and it's going strong, and we have a lot more to learn this week. This morning, Dr. O'Mara started our day by talking about the art and science of symptom science, and she talked about two great scientists who followed their passion to study cancer pain. And I think that word Dr. Feedon started in Dr. Whalen's introduction about that passion, I think that's a great word to think about how our day fits together. Dr. Snap talked about her passion for figuring out that 34 to 36 weaker. And I asked her what drove her to do that research. She said, it just doesn't make sense the way they're cared for, that they're not one lump, that they're so different across those many weeks, and that there's something different that we have to figure out. Jean Geiger-Brown and our translation team for looking at introducing uh, napping for our night shift nurses that follows well on the policy of the American Nurses Association to look at healthy uh, policies for nurses. Really that passion shown through in what we can do to change our, our human resources and to introduce this innovation for our night shift nurses to prevent harm to patients and to themselves. We had passion of Dr. Helen Schreigel talking about really inspiring interprofessional teams to work on the quality improvements that we need in our hospitals today. And the hundreds of posters that we got to look at today and to evaluate as we walked out, and it was crowded down there, and we were really enjoying each other, and especially the popcorn as well. But finally, Dr. Whalen, your presentation, who really, uh, I see, translating your passion for advocacy and policy and really has driven home the importance of translational research. 
We've really gone today from the bench to the bedside to policy and advocacy, and we thank you for tying that together for us today. So we thank you all for your attendance. We look forward to seeing you next year at our fourth annual Nursing Research and Quality Day. And we want you to take these messages of passion and inspiration home with you and to take that passion into all of your work that you do. So as Pam says, what we are here for is to make care better for our patients and families. Thank you so much for being with us today.